So I've been told this evening I have to be on my very best behaviour and absolutely no swearing. And of course I never would swear in front of such a distinguished audience, least of all in front of my children sat here as well. Um, but I do want to talk about the F word this evening. Which F word, you might ask? Not that one. <laughs> I want to talk about fossil fuels. I want to talk about the way in which the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, one of the key instruments we have to tackle climate change, agreed back in 2015 and signed by over 190 countries, does not mention fossil fuels. This is a problem because, of course, 76% of greenhouse gas emissions come from the burning of fossil fuels. So this is a very serious emission. So although governments and cities and corporations declare that we're in a state of climate emergency, they're not acting as if we're in a, cl in a climate emergency. In fact, quite the reverse. A report issued just today by the Stockholm Environment Institute and the United Nations Environment Programme called the Production Gap Report found that governments around the world are planning to burn and extract 120% more fossil fuels than would be compatible with the aims of the Paris Agreement. So we have a very serious problem here. And what I want to share with you tonight briefly is a way in which we're trying to tackle that issue. We're trying to bring in a new approach to tackling the climate crisis, which fairly leaves remaining reserves of fossil fuels in the ground. Now, the story starts, as most good stories do, in a pub. It starts in a pub in South London on a rainy night in October 2018, where I was having a few drinks with my friend and collaborator, Andrew Sims. Andrew Sims is the head of the New Weather Institute in London, but also an associate researcher here at Sussex. And amid general catch-up, gossip and speculation about whether Brighton were going to win the Premiership title that season, <laughs> that lasted a few seconds, uh, we got on, as nerds like us do, to thinking about the fact that it was the anniversary in 2018, the 50th anniversary of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And this was negotiated in 1968 at the height of Cold War tensions over just a few years uh, period. And that treaty has as its core structure three key pillars, non-proliferation, disarmament, and peaceful use. And as the conversation went on, we started to think, could those principles, could those three pillars apply equally to fossil fuels? Could we imagine that non-proliferation would be about not expanding fossil fuel frontiers of coal and oil and gas? Could disarmament be about trying to manage the decline away from existing fossil fuel investments and infrastructures? And could peaceful use be about accelerating the transition to lower carbon alternative forms of energy, particularly for some of the poorest countries in the world? And so we played around with this idea and thought more about it had a couple more drinks and went our separate ways. And the following morning, I woke up thinking, there's something in this. This is an idea that we need to develop. We need to push it forward. And so I wrote it up as an opinion piece. It's just a short piece making the case for a, a treaty and an alternative approach. And I sent it to Andrew. He wordsmithed it a bit. And we sent it off to the Guardian newspaper, who then published it as uh, an op-ed piece. And thereafter, the story took off. We got a letter of support from the activist and writer Naomi Klein. We got support from Bill McKibben, the head of 350.org, the organization in the US which is leading the fossil fuel divestment movement. We got letters of support from the heads of Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth in the UK, and also from our own local MP here, Caroline Lucas. But of course, that raised the question, fine, you've written an op-ed, that's the basic idea. What's the meat of this? What would this actually look like? What would this new treaty do? What would be the institutions, the mechanism, the financing, the procedures, the principles? And so I went away and started to draft this as an academic article, and I got it published in the journal Climate Policy. And so far, it's been downloaded nearly 12,000 times, uh, which isn't bad for an academic article. I'd normally settle for two or three downloads, and that's, that's normally what we get. But this one got 11,000. So I knew we were onto something. From there, the story moves to Vancouver in Canada, where the fantastic and inspirational activist Zabora Berman from Stand Earth decided she wanted to launch a global campaign based on this idea, based on this call for a treaty. And so she set up organizations and networks in Asia, Africa, Latin America, Europe, North America involved in this. 
So far and to date, over 800 organisations have now signed up to support this initiative. And these are movements from indigenous groups, labour movements, faith-based faith organisations and environmental organisations. From there, the story goes up a level again because the former Irish president, Mary Robinson, took the idea to the United Nations Security Council and pitched it there. And below that, and at the same time, cities were starting to get involved. There's about 15 cities now that have declared their backing for this treaty idea. And this includes major players like Vancouver, Toronto, Sydney, the Australian Capital Territory, Barcelona in Europe, and closer to home, Lewis District Council, just down the road. <laughs> so the cities got on board, and then the academics woke up and thought, well, this is a good idea, and they wanted to be part of the picture too. And there was a letter recently by over 1,800 academics and leading scientists in this area supporting the treaty. And then the world's Nobel laureates, over 100 of them, also wrote a letter backing the treaty idea, led by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. But it's not just activists, politicians, others. Some of the key figures in the UK and beyond have started to lend their support to this idea. In the UK, for example, Sir Ed Davey, the former climate minister and head leader of the Liberal Democrats party, has spoken in Parliament in favour of this idea. Clive Lewis from the Labour Party. Some Conservative uh, MPs are showing support for this. And of course, Caroline Lucas has proposed a fossil fuel non-proliferation bill before Parliament. But again, it's not just in the UK. There's now over 100 parliamentarians across 25 countries backing this. So it's growing across sectors, across regions, across movements, across actors. And when I stop to think about how this came to be, how this seedling of an idea hatched on a boozy night in South London was taken all the way up to the UN in New York, I guess I'm struck by three key things. Firstly, change can actually happen really quickly and in surprising ways, and in ways that we don't really control. Secondly, that universities have a key role to play in this, and I'm very proud that Sussex is such a leader in sustainability research, and that the idea came from here. It really shows that ideas can move into action, they can occasionally cut through. And thirdly, that hope is important, it's crucial, hope over despair. In this moment of climate chaos, with climate impacts we're seeing all around the world and statements of climate emergency, it's easy to get uh, downtrodden, to be overwhelmed by the scale of the crisis. But we need these stories of hope. We need what we call in the Rapid Transition Alliance evidence-based hope, evidence about the possibility of change and alternatives. So to wrap up, clearly we're not going to get a new fossil treaty in the very near future. We certainly won't get one at the Glasgow summit. But I do believe we've shifted the conversation. We've moved it in a new direction. We've named the elephant in the room. We need to tackle fossil fuels and their phase out fairly and quickly. But we're up against some of the most powerful actors in the global economy. Many corporations, very well funded corporations, very well networked politically are vehemently opposed to this, as of course are many governments around the world. But I do believe the genie's out the bottle now. The movement is in this direction. There's more and more actors coming on board. And I think this is an exciting time. And I see real possibilities for this idea moving forward. So if you do want to know more, just Google fossil treaty or fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, and you'll find more details about it. And I really don't know where this story is going to end up or if we'll ever get a treaty indeed. But I do know that it's going to be an exciting ride and I invite you to join us. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>